folks, if I could disturb your lunch just briefly, please keep noshing, that's fine. Um, and so I'm happy to introduce Rabbi Dr. Steinberg to talk about the medical profession in the state. Thank you. I was asked to speak from the podium because of the camera. I thought it would be nicer to sit together and be have a conversation rather than a formal presentation, but these are the orders, so <laughs> I have to follow them. Um, so the topic is a medical profession and the state. I'm not sure and clear what exactly the topic means, but I'll start with some uh, understanding on my part, and then we can expand it, whoever feels uh, that the topic leads to different directions, so we'll, we'll take it there. So just as a matter of uh, general introduction, I think what happened in the since World War II, uh, and cer certainly the last six, seven decades, really uh, changed the face of medicine in a way that was unknown previously, both clinical medicine and research medicine. And what I mean by that is that A, the scientific advancements that occurred during this period of uh, 60, 70 years is really unprecedented in a way that in the old days, and old days is 50 years ago, 100 years ago, and certainly 2,000 years ago, medicine advanced very slowly. It took a long time before some idea or some result took and, and produced uh, further advancements. What is happening in the last few decades is a very rapid progression in all fields of medicine <clears throat> in a way that was not only unknown before, but actually was unimagined before. Whoever imagined that you can take a heart from one person and put it in another person and, and he will live for so long longer. All the fertility advancements, egg donation, surrogacy, all these are principles that were never thought about as being possible. So we are talking about an entire different world from a medical point of view. That is on the clinical side. On the, uh, on the experimental side, Again, we're talking about experiments that involve thousands of subjects uh, at the same time, which was never done before. Uh, Double-blinded uh, experiments, which were unknown before. Uh, randomized and, and other uh, methods of experimentation, which gives a higher validity to the results. These are all new phenomena that we, if you think about it, we are living in it, so we are used to it, but actually it's totally new. That combined with a real revolution, which I mentioned uh, last night, in a patient-physician relationship from a paternalistic approach to an autonomistic approach is, is a major change that, uh, if you think about it, for 2,500 years, Hippocratic viewpoint that the physician that makes the decisions for the patient with the best intention, because he thinks that this is really for the patient's good, this became, I think, uh, exaggerated, and I'll say a few words about it, but in practice, this became almost a, a dirty word. You can't use paternalism anymore. It's illegal, it's unethical, and, and you can't practice it anymore, and you have to respect the autonomy of the patient and do whatever he wants. Even though you, as a physician, feel that the decision of the patient is wrong, is stupid, is dangerous, whatever uh, you can say about the decision of the patient, Yet you have to follow. You can't override his autonomous decisions. A few other points that changed quite dramatically during this period of time is the authority 
several of the speakers and myself spoke about the German hierarchy, which was very strict. And if the professor said something, no one would reject, no one would argue, no one would go, said, certainly not for a second opinion, that would be an insult to the, to the, to the physician that takes care of you. Nowadays, patients go to a physician only in order to go for a second opinion and compare the opinion. So there's no more authority in a sense that we were used to. On top of this, there's a much greater involvement of many people in a decision of a particular individual. In Hippocratic days, there were no hospitals. There were no experts in, in sub, uh, sub-medical uh, fields. There was the physician who made the house call, who was the physician for the elderly and for the pregnant woman and for the child. <clears throat> he was one physician for everything, and there was no involvement with any other people, whether other medical experts or Uh, social workers or uh, physiotherapists or whatever. There was just the one physician that made his own decision, and that's all. Nowadays, someone calculated a few years ago that in a university-based hospital, at least 100 people are involved one way or another in every particular patient. If you take into account uh, all the... Uh, te- technicians and all the lab experts and all the uh, experts. One is expert for the right ear and one is an expert for the left uh, finger. And th- there are so many people involved in taking care of one individual, which by, uh, by exclusion, obviously there will be many opinions, what is the right thing to do for this particular uh, individual. And if this isn't enough, many of the cases may leak out to the press and to the courts and there are uh, uh, malpractice suits. The physicians have become in a situation where they are, n- they are no more in any control of the patient, both because the patient makes the decision and many other people experts are involved, and sometimes even the public at large. So all these changes, uh, I think, brought to a change in the subject that uh, uh, I understand is the topic of this uh, meeting now. Uh, How is the state involved in the medical profession? Now, if we go back years ago, and we go to the one physician, to the paternalistic approach, to the slowly growing uh, advancements in medicine, no other involvement, then obviously the state was never involved. There were no laws, no legislations regarding particular situations in medicine, and that was understandable. But once all these changes occurred that I just mentioned, and there are many others that we can mention, there must be some regulation because everyone will do something different. And if this particular patient would end up by chance in the hospital in Georgetown and someone else with the same condition will be in Einstein in New York, he would get different treatments depending on who is the the physician in this particular uh, Hospital, what is the policy of this particular department, and what is the policy of the hospital at large? And there may be so many different regulations that the patient, incidentally, coming to this hospital or to that hospital, won't know what kind of a treatment he would get and be entitled. We did a study in Jerusalem uh, a few years ago regarding end-of-life decisions. And we looked uh, prospectively on decision-making on end-of-life situations in our hospital where I work, which is Sharet Tzedek in Jerusalem. And it turned out that the same type of situation of 
a dying patient or of an end-of-life situation, it would depend who the physician was in the emergency room who accepted him. One would intubate, another one would not intubate. One would uh, give him antibiotics and another one wouldn't. And it depended on what department in the hospital he was accepted. It could be internal medicine A, and there the policy was one, and internal medicine B, the policy would be another one, and so on. And not to speak about another hospital where another decision-making situation would be. So there was an example of, of one situation which is almost daily not almost, daily occurring end-of-life situations. All the time people come uh, to hospitals with this situation, and there's no, uh, no one way of treating such patients. So therefore, I think without uh, state involvement by legislation, by regulation, it will be really a chaotic situation. The counter-argument is, why not? Let every physician, with every patient, make the individual decision, and one will do it one way, one will do it another way. But since a patient can't decide in an emergency situation, or even in an non-emergency situation, but in a complicated medical situation, he can't decide a priori where he will get the treatment that he would like or that the family would like or that someone else would uh, advise him to have it, maybe the, the priest or the rabbi or someone else involved in, in the decision-making situation, unless there is some uniformity in decision-making. So I just uh, looked into the Israeli situation on the state involvement in medical decisions. So we have at least 15 different major legislations, major laws that were enacted to regulate major issues that in the years before would have been just a private decision between the patient and the physician. So one is called the uh, patient rights uh, legislation which switched in Israel in 1996 the situation from a paternalistic approach to an autonomous approach. We came later than in the United States on this uh, matter. With Some people say that Israel regards itself as the 51st state of the United States. So whatever happens here, 10 years later, we adapt it. And sometimes, 10 years later, in the United States, they already regretted what they did, but we still adopt what they thought 10 years ago. And I think that happened with uh, this uh, bill of uh, patients' rights, which in principle reflects correctly the change from a paternalistic approach to autonomous approach. But it is so strictly autonomous that A, I think it's impossible to to implement, and B, I think it's wrong uh, philosophically because I think that here uh, Pellegrino, Dr. Pellegrino in his book for the patient's right, formulated, uh, uh, I think, the right formula, which is strong autonomy, weak paternalism, meaning that a physician should respect autonomy but he shouldn't be just a mechanic who gives information and whatever the patient decides, he has to follow. He has to exercise some level of paternalism when he feels that this is indeed a wrong decision on, on the patient's side and he should direct him correctly and sometimes even abstain from treating the patient if he insists on a decision that his autonomy doesn't allow him to do. But the Israeli law doesn't let any ex exceptions to the autonomous decision, which went all the way to the extreme uh, of autonomy, requiring a physician to disclose or to explain to the patient everything known 
on the disease, on the complications, on the prognosis, on everything that medicine knows about, which A, is impossible because maybe yesterday there was an article in the New England of one case report, and even I don't know about it yet, but if the patient uh, will be... Uh, there'll be a complication. They'll say, why didn't you tell me that there was a case in the New England? I would have reconsidered my decision or things of this kind. But even so, to tell a patient everything known confuses a person who is not in the medical field. If you, patients, many of them don't understand what statistics mean. So if you tell them that there is one per 10,000 uh, mortality with the treatment, he hears that he is going to die from the treatment and he refuses the treatment, which is the right treatment for him. And many other such examples. So I think it went overboard just in order to control the bad physicians who don't listen to the patients and do whatever they want. I, I mentioned the end-of-life situation. I chaired a public committee before there was a legislation in Israel in, in the year of 2000. We, uh, we composed a committee of 59 members. And imagine three Jews speaking about the weather. Usually you get at least six opinions. And here it's not the weather and it's not three, it's... 59, although not all were Jews, we, uh, Israel is a state where there are uh, non-Jew citizens as well, so we had representatives of uh, Christian, Muslim, Druze, and others. <clears throat> it was a difficult task to come to any consensus on such a difficult uh, situation, but finally we reached a consensus. There were some uh, who didn't agree with one or two of the paragraphs, but not even a minority opinion, and that finally became the law of the land, what we proposed. So there is a legislation on how to treat a dying patient. Now, many of the, it's a, it's a huge uh, law, many of the paragraphs there are not accepted by everyone. Obviously, in such a situation, people would think differently about what is allowed and not allowed to do for a dying patient. And yet, it made order so that in every place, wherever a patient will come, his situation will be treated the same way according to the law. That, or at least this was the idea. Transplants that became available, so again, how do you uh, prioritize? Who do you give uh, first the, the heart or the, the liver that, was, uh, that becomes available? Are you allowed to pay for it? Are, are you allowed to have an agent that will push it? All kinds of questions that come up with the situation that is new, that you can transplant organs. So there's a law on organ transplants. There's a huge halachic debate on what is the moment of death, how you determine the moment of death. Is it related to what we call brain death or a cardiac death? And some hold that as long as the heart is functioning, even though the person is brain dead and has no ability to breathe on his own, he is still alive. And others say the heart is irrelevant. What is relevant is the brain or the breathing. And if you can prove that he is brain dead, then he is dead, despite the fact that his heart is still functioning. So that has to be uh, put into order. You have to legislate it because it will be impossible that in, in one place they'll call him dead and in another place they won't call him dead, and so on. When we... Uh, know how to uh, obtain eggs and or, or surrogacy, you have to regulate it. Uh, there are questions of identity. If, if the egg comes from woman A and the uh, surrogate is woman B, who is the mother? How do you decide on such matters? These are things that a private physician can't make a decision. You need, uh, you need a state to intervene and decide what you do. We had just before our Israeli government uh, fell apart and there is now coming up a new uh, government, 
So the last first reading legislation in the Knesset of the previous uh, government was uh, in reference to obtaining semen after death. There is a window of about 24 to 48 hours after death of a male that you can still take semen and impregnate a woman so that he will have a, a continuing a continuation of his uh, of his genes of his uh, lifetime so what what would be the case if the parents want a child a grandchild to re to remember their child who died would it be permissible to do this act without knowing if the person who died would have wanted a foreign woman that will raise a child that is his, but he, he never saw it and he'll, he'll never have a, a contact with him. If he's married and his widow wants it, is it better? There are all kinds of situations. And what if the mother says yes and the father says no? And all kinds of complications. So that was uh, legislated at least the first reading and hopefully it will go on. There's a very extensive law regarding genetics. Who is the owner of the genetic material? Who do you disclose the situation? Uh, whether you tell everything that you found, all kinds of uh, rare diseases unrelated to the reason that you did the uh, testing, and many other uh, ethical questions that the state intervened. Now, is it right or wrong for the state to be so involved in medical decisions? So I think that since the authority of the physician has lost its, its power, and the physician in most cases has to go according to someone, the patient, the state, the, the Ministry of Health, someone has has to conduct him and, and tell him what to do. There is no choice but to have the government involved in different ways. It can be by laws, it can be by regulations, it can be by uh, asking the, the professionals of the physicians to, to write guidelines, but there has to be something that will uh, control what physicians are doing. That is on the clinical level. On the experimental level, <clears throat> we have this uh, wonderful conference dealing with what happened when uh, experiments are done wrongly. But we can argue it was done wrongly by the government. The government pushed the physicians, as we heard today, to experiment in such a terrible way but assuming <clears throat> that governments in democratic states and countries are not like the Nazis, their involvement in making sure that experiments are done in an ethical way and that ambitious physicians will not do go overboard to, to succeed in their experiment and, and, and be free to do whatever they want, again, there has to be some form of regulation and some form of uh, supervision. And that's why in most Western, or maybe all Western uh, countries, there are IRBs in every institution that conducts research on human beings. So someone tells the researcher, the physician who is a researcher, how to conduct the research, and if they think that something is wrong in his uh, process of conducting the research, to, to, to correct it and not let it go on. So again, there is a governmental involvement. So I think that in principle, there's no choice nowadays but to have a government or a ministry uh, looking into uh, major issues in medicine and uh, being involved in it, which wasn't the case years ago. Now, whether the medical community is happy with this approach or not depends who you ask. Some physicians are 
very happy that someone else made a decision for them and they go by a protocol. Uh, in Israel, we say that physicians don't like to think on their own. They like a protocol. That's what they are told to do. That's what they do. And they are free from uh, thinking about issues that it's not their the direct uh, expertise. Others will say, we know better what is good for this particular patient. Let us decide for him and don't put on us barriers and rules and laws. And sometimes it may cause more damage than, than benefit. So in balance, I think that nowadays there's no choice but to have a governmental involvement or state involvement, but it has to be done in a logical way and in a, in a balancing way and not just everything by the state or nothing by the state. So some in between has, <coughs> excuse me, has to be taken care of. Okay, that's just uh, in a way of an introduction and I'll be glad to hear uh, what you have to say on these or similar issues. Yes. Okay, so I, I think your, your point is well taken. It was true that in these years, and maybe earlier, the, the prevailing approach was not to disclose to a patient something serious for fear that he'll become depressed, he may even commit suicide, he won't be able to handle this uh, information, and better for others who care for him and who know what is good for him, to let him know that uh, things are okay, we're taking care of it, and not to tell what he has. That was a prevailing uh, attitude uh, in, in patient-physician relationships, certainly with a paternalistic approach that I know better anyway what's good for him, and why should I uh, bother him or put him into the dilemma or make him upset if I, if anyway I'll do what, what is needed to be done and uh, what do I care if he, he knows or not and better not to tell. But that has changed dramatically, A, because legally it's forbidden. You can't do any procedure on, you couldn't do any procedure on your father unless he consents and the consent has to be informed. So how would it be informed if he doesn't know what he has? So, so legally, it's impossible today to, to not to disclose. That, that is clear. I yeah. Um, but even from a practical point of view, today it's impossible to conceal such a thing. The, if he's in a hospital, someone will say something, a nurse or, a, or someone else in the team, and the information will come in a wrong way rather than sitting quietly with the physician who can explain it correctly and a team can be helpful to get him overcome the, the upsetness of, of knowing what he has, it, it's just impossible not to do it this way nowadays. So both from a legal point of view and from a practical point of view, that is certainly the way to do it. From an ethical point of view, I personally think that you should let the patient navigate how much information he wants, but he should know the, the beginning of it. So, 
Some physicians say, or, or like the Israeli law, you have to tell him right away everything that you know about the disease, the prognosis, the complications, everything. This, I think, is wrong ethically because some patients, part of their denial and part of their way to, to handle such bad news is not to know certain things. So let him direct me if he wants to know more or if he is satisfied with what he knows, he... He relies on me, he thinks that I'm a good physician and I'll take good care of him. And he doesn't want to know all the details. Why impose on him so many details? But by an autonomy philosophy, you have to tell him because he is autonomous. He has to know everything. And I think here are the limits that uh, we are a little overboard with autonomy. That's my personal uh, understanding. But I think that even legally, if you tell the principle of the problem and you let the patient direct you how much he wants to know, when does he want to know, maybe now he wants a little less and he has to, to think about it. And then tomorrow he will come and say, I have a question, I want to know this, I want to know that, and, and gradually give him the information that, that he needs in order to make a decision. Okay, th th this case is complicated. I don't want to go into the, the details when to put a feeding tube and when not, but your mother was unconscious, so it was, your, uh, was incompetent. So it was the family's decision and maybe a surrogate that was appointed or whatever. So that's a different story. But coming back to the competent patient that you just want to shield him from knowing bad news... <clears throat> There's an interesting uh, discrepancy in biblical stories. There is a story about King Hiskiyahu, one of the kings in Judea, that was sick, we would call him today, with a terminal illness. He was dying. And the prophet Yeshayahu was told by God that he should go to Hiskiyahu, to the king, and tell him you should make your order in your house because you are dying, directly telling him exactly you are going to die. And he did it, and Hiskiyahu told him, is this the way you talk to a dying patient? You come to him and you say, make your house in order because you are dying. Straightforward, that's not the way to talk to a sick patient. But he repented, the king repented, and he got another 15 years to live, despite the prophecy that he's going to die now. A, con a contrary story is with a king of a neighboring uh, nation, Aram, that came to another prophet, to Elisha, and he had a terminal illness, 
And uh, he came to Elisha to ask him, uh, what will happen with me? And Elisha told him, don't worry, you will live. And in, in parentheses, as if the, the Bible says that he knew that he won't survive. He's going to die, but he told him, don't worry, everything will be okay. So on the one hand, we see that the prophet is telling the patient directly what he has and what his prognosis. On the other hand, we see that the prophet lied to the patient and didn't upset him by telling him the bad news. So where's the difference? So the difference depends on the personality of the patient. If you assess that the patient is someone that would like to know the prognosis because he wants to repent in the story of Cheskiah, because he wants to, to make order of his house, because he wants to make decisions how to treat him, a feeding tube or not a feeding tube, he wants to make the decisions. So he has to know. Whereas, and if you assess that this is a patient that if you tell him the truth, he will collapse, then it's preferable not to tell him. That's the, uh, the, the balance between the two stories. But as I said, nowadays, it's impossible not to tell because uh, it will come out uh, one way or another. So better it should come out the right way with the patience and with the expertise of the one who is telling than a neighbor coming in and said, you know, I heard the terrible news and all of a sudden he finds out that he has a, a prostate cancer and no one told him. So I think today things have changed. We have a paternalistic situation now where the state has become father, journalistic, or the corporation or whoever is hiring the physician. At the same time, the physician is obligated to be autonomous and tell everything. What happens in between, I already told you everything, I don't have anything else to do. Because the paternalism has now been turned over to the state. Where is the physician's professionalism? What are the ethics of the profession that says, I have not fulfilled my responsibility as a patient just by telling them what they have. What's the, what's the medical profession professing in that new situation where autonomy and paternalism being turned upside down. Right. So, so again, it's my, my take. You, you're allowed to disagree. You, you can take it differently. But I think that there are two autonomies here. There's the autonomy of the patient, and there's the autonomy of the physician. He also has his own autonomy. Now, if they go together, if the patient wants something and the physician agrees with it, and the state laws are confirming that that's okay to make such a decision, then it's easy. But if a patient autonomously wants a certain act to be done or not to be done, and I as a physician think that this is a mistake on his part, so if I am 100% autonomous, I should say, that's your decision, I'm not interfering, I do exactly what you want. So I'm a mechanic, like someone has a car, he comes to the garage, the garage person says uh, the, the wheel aren't good, the, 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 the whatever, and tell me what to fix, and I'll fix whatever you'll tell me. And if you don't want to fix anything, I won't fix anything. I think that is wrong in a patient-physician relationship, and I think there is an obligation on the physician to try to explain to the patient that his decision is not the right decision, based on my expertise as a physician. And if, despite my explanation, the, the patient insists to, from I, what I think is a wrong decision, then the only option that I have as a physician is to abstain from treatment of this patient because I have my own autonomy. I don't want to harm the patient, but I have no means to fix it other than to try to convince him because the state told me that you can't do it if the patient doesn't agree, right? So I still keep my autonomy by abstaining from this particular situation. Sometimes, I think that the decision of the patient is wrong on a medical ground. He refuses a certain treatment, and I know that it's not in his best interest, but he continues to refuse. 
And sometimes it's on a conscientious level. Uh, the best example is uh, abortion. If a woman comes and says, I, I don't want this uh, child for no reason. It's not your business why. I want an abortion. And I, as a physician, conscientiously think that that is a wrong decision. Medically, it can be done. But I feel that this is uh, conscientiously a wrong decision. Again, I should be able to abstain from taking care of this woman contrary to my beliefs. I have my own uh, set of ethics and, and beliefs that I shouldn't transgress it. The only exception to this, which becomes difficult, is if no one is willing to do what the patient is, wants. I abstain, but she can't find anyone who will do the abortion on her demand. But still, she has the autonomy to ask for an abortion. I'm not talking about the new situation in, in the United States after the Supreme Court, but I'm talking principle. <clears throat> that poses a, a real dilemma, because if you go by autonomy and she has to have her autonomous wishes one way or another fulfilled, and no one is willing to fulfill it, that is a collision between autonomy and paternalism. But if I abstain and there's another physician who is willing to do it, so why force me to do something which is contrary to my conscientious decision? So either medical or ethical conscientious, I should have the right to abstain. By the way, in, in the Israeli law on end of life, we introduce such a paragraph into the law because there are difficult decisions. Sometimes a patient says, I don't want to be treated anymore, or I want you to withdraw the respirator. And I, as a physician, feel that that is wrong, either medically or conscientiously. So the Israeli law allows the physician to abstain from continuing the treatment of this patient and finding another physician who will be able to follow what the patient wants and, and he doesn't object to it, either medically or conscientiously. So. I think that is a solution that takes into account the balance between the different uh, complicated uh, decision making. Comes when the state doesn't recognize conscience clause physicians. Right. Then you have a problem. Right. And uh, you also see when the physicians stand up and say, "No, I'm not going to do this," and the state hauls them off for not doing something. But it's certainly, it's a real issue in states like Canada and right. Asia and elsewhere. Right. What do you do with physicians in right. town is irrelevant. In Canada, you have to inform the patient that he has a right for euthanasia. And if I feel that euthanasia is murder and I am uh, helping him to commit uh, sin, such grave sin, I want to be free not to, not to do it. Uh, let the state publicize who the physicians are in the state that agree to it. And then he can find why should I be the vehicle for the states. But Canada didn't agree to this. So that's a major question. Yes. To what extent do you think end of life treatment, especially like passive euthanasia, like, you know, taking the patient off and feeding the tube out? To what extent do you think that's a self-fulfilling prophecy in that, you know, by making that choice, you're leaving the patient to die and you don't really have the opportunity to see how things play out? And how do you think regulations from a statewide perspective affect that? Because I'm thinking about, I don't know if you're familiar with the case of Jahai McMath, who was a girl in California a few years ago, and, you know, she underwent a surgery, had a lot of bleeding, was put on a ventilator, her family insisted that she remain on the ventilator, even though that went against California's law of brain death, sent her to New Jersey where she was allowed to be kept on the ventilator. And then she ended up living, depending on how you define death, for another four or five years, I believe. So, right. self-fulfilling <clears throat> So here, there was at least the option to move from California to New Jersey. There was a similar case in England where a baby who was born asphyxiated and actually didn't have any quality of life, but was kept on a respirator for a while. And then the hospital decided that uh, there's no point to continue and 
wanted to disconnect the respirator. Halachically, that is not allowed to do. And the family was uh, a religious uh, Jewish family, and they refused to, to disconnect the respirator. So it went to the courts in England, and the court decided that the best interest of the baby is to die, and hence order to remove the respirator, despite the family's objection. I, I wrote an affidavit there to the courts to, to explain that from a Jewish point of view that's wrong, and, and what do you care if the baby will be on a respirator? It wasn't even a matter of money. It wasn't that because they felt that he should die and you keep him in the hospital, so the, 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 the government is paying for the, for the survival. It was a principle that that's the best interest. And I was very surprised that the court decided that the best interest is to kill the baby. That uh, always uh, can be the best interest. Anyway, the family requested, if you don't let us continue the treatment in England because this is the law of the land, let us move the child to Israel. There, there were, one of the parents was an Israeli citizen. So it's like moving from California to New Jersey, and the courts didn't allow it. Because they said that in Israel, he, the baby will be continuing uh, receiving the treatment, and it's not the best interest even there, and therefore, and at the end, they removed the respirator. What? That's pretty paternalism. Oh, <laughs> it's legal paternalism. If it's medical paternalism, it's wrong. But if it's legal paternalism, it's okay. So it, it, it's a difficult situation. Yes? I'd like to push a little bit more on the state versus um, the professional um, I uh, have been practicing neonatology for a very long time. Um, and uh, I remember I asked you maybe 30 years ago about <laughs> the threshold of viability. And uh, uh, at the time, you didn't feel that there was a limit. We're now pushing more and more. And now we're, uh, again, running into problems, as uh, you explained, in terms of if I say something and somebody else says something else and another hospital says it gets really very hard on parents because they're hearing different things coming up. So there's a need to have some kind of regulation. The difficulty is that I have been trying to do something like this for years and my colleagues find it incredibly difficult to agree to anything. Because they, you know, well, we, we might be able to do something for 21 weeks, you know, going down and down and down. Um, and the thing is that how do you uh, allow for the professional economy when you do have the need for parents to have some kind of consistency? Otherwise, it's crazy making. Right. So... We in Israel had difficulty with this particular situation of what do you do in the delivery room when a baby is born, let's say 22 weeks, 21 is, is still, uh, maybe in some places, but in most places 22 is the limit of life in, in, most, uh, in most nurseries. A baby is born 22 weeks gestation and do you resuscitate or not? And that's a decision of a second. If you don't resuscitate, obviously the baby won't survive. If you resuscitate, maybe it will survive, and most likely it will survive with a lot of disabilities. And do you do it or not? What, what's the decision for the moment? So one way is to pre prepare ahead of time with the parents, especially if the mother is still not in labor and and her consent uh, makes sense, and discuss it and say, if the baby will be born at 22 or less, we won't resuscitate. If we will be born 23 or more, we will resuscitate. Let's say that this would be the decision. Then at least the parents who are the natural surrogates made the decision for the baby. But in, most, in many instances, I don't know if most, it happens all of a sudden, uh, the, the woman goes into labor, 
She certainly is not in her right uh, mind with the pain of labor and with all the excitement around to make an informed consent of life and death situation of the baby. So who, who makes the decision in this case? And we approached the neonatology uh, uni, uh, uh, society in Israel, and they couldn't come to a conclusion. They couldn't tell us professionally what do they think is the right thing to do, to put a limit, to put a moving limit, to decide according to the expertise of the particular hospital. Some have more, some have less expertise. They couldn't decide. So we certainly couldn't decide it as a law. If, if the professionals don't know what to do, how can we decide for them? And it was left out. And I think that they regret it because now every, every neonatologist that is called to the delivery room for a baby 22, 23 weeks of gestation has to make his own decision. And it's very hard to make such a decision. So I think that it has to come from the professionals and then we can decide legally if it falls into all the parameters that the law would agree or not agree to this decision. But if the professionals don't know, what can we do? So it's a, it's a real big problem. Yes. So I think that just kind of speaks to the broader issue of obviously the difference of like compliance for ethics, but also like for the clinicians to be the ones that are making the decision. This is totally just a comment. Um, what sort of strategies, if anyone can even speak to, would you use to kind of build the consensus within your organization or on the broader spectrum how to influence policy so that it reflects what is the consensus <coughs> or generally accepted practices um, within specialties? So, if I understood correctly your question, I think it's, it's a very relevant uh, question. I think that most democratic countries nowadays try to legislate what they understand is the best ethical, legal, uh, professional decision on major issues, not on every variant. You can't, you can't legislate on every variant and on every case, but you can give broad, broader uh, uh, rules and then make it a law. But like every law, it is subject to criticism, to uh, changes. And if you feel that the law is not according to your organization or even privately, you think something is wrong with this legislation, either professionally or ethically or religiously or, or uh, legally, something is wrong, you should uh, voice your opinion, absolutely. In, in this legislation of the dying patient, there are uh, decisions that were made by the committee and then by the Israeli parliament, by the Knesset, and there are professionals and ethicists and, uh, and legalists who are unhappy with certain parts of the law. And they are going now, the, again, before this uh, government fell, there were some proposals to make some corrections in the law, which they felt should be done. I personally didn't disagree with what they are suggesting, but that's, that's a democracy. You, you should do what you think is right to do. Um, do you think you could speak um, about the ethics of paternalism and autonomy um, for patients with disabilities like autism, um, schizophrenia, or like Down syndrome, like these pervasive psychological disorders? Because um, I found that even like disabled adults under like many legal frameworks are still, this is kind of the state overreach that you were talking about, treated as wards of the state, deprived of full civil rights as adults, and often um, doctors, um, I found, take like paternal, paternalistic attitudes toward disabled patients, um, don't inform them fully about conditions, um, kind of assume how much they can understand versus not understand. There was a big case of this with, in the case of Down syndrome, where a woman sued for her right to determine how much treatment and support for her own condition she wanted. And do you think that um, this is one area where 
um, even if the trend overall has been toward too little paternalism, this is still a stronghold where too much paternalism is still the norm? Okay, so I think the, the answer to it in principle is easy, in practice it's difficult. In principle, autonomy can be uh, exercised only by an autonomous agent. Only a person who has competency enough to make a decision can exercise autonomy. If a three-year-old child says it's uh, cold now, but I want to go in shorts, and the parents say, you can't do it, you'll get sick, or, or it's not good for you, so it's a paternalistic approach to the child. Why? Because he's only three years old, and we assume that he is not an autonomous agent. So that is true for every disabled person who has a limited cognition. And the ones who decide on it are usually psychiatrists who evaluate the competency of the person. He may be disabled physically, he may be disabled mentally, he may be disabled intellectually. There are a lot of variants of uh, disabilities. And if he assesses that he has competency, then by all means, you have to treat him like uh, any other person. The fact that he is disabled doesn't lessen at all his autonomy. But if the assessment is, and by the way, a Down syndrome is, is a very wide variety of competency. There are Down syndromes with IQ of 20 that can't make any decision, and there are Down syndromes with IQ of 70 who can who can come to this lecture and maybe even give a lecture. The, the, that is something that uh, is very variable in Down syndrome. Uh, other uh, disabilities where the mental retardation is more profound, whether he's a child or an adult, then there has to be a surrogate that acts on his behalf, and uh, he is the representative of the patient towards the physician. So again, a physician cannot make a decision on a disabled person unless either the disabled person is competent and agrees to it, or he has a surrogate that uh, makes decision on his behalf. And a surrogate can be either a natural surrogate, which usually are parents, or an appointed surrogate that usually a court appoints someone that is reliable, that wants for the good of the disabled person, and he represents him towards, uh, towards the physician. By the way, uh, in experimental situations, it is not as simple as it sounds, because sometimes we need to do experiments on incompetent disabled people, because the treatment is for them. Let's say uh, we want to invent a new uh, medication for a comatose patient. And we need to give it to him as an experimental drug while he is comatose. He can't make any decisions. He can't consent to it. How do you experiment on such people? That is part of the Helsinki uh, declaration that in such conditions, you have to evaluate the importance of the research. You can't do it for any... A small research that you just are interested to do, the amount, the, the, the ratio between the, uh, the damage and the benefit that this particular uh, expertise person will uh, derive, and there should be a surrogate that will agree to make the decision, and provided that if the person will become competent again, Let's say he'll come out of the coma. He, he has to agree retroactively to what was done with him, which I don't understand the logic of it because it was done already. So, so what's the logic to get his uh, consent? But I think the idea was that the consent has to be somewhere. So even if it's not beneficial as much, uh, you still has, have to obtain his consent. But these are complicated situations which are not done necessarily for his benefit. They are part of a research, but not. it's, it's different than in a clinical situation. Yes? It's totally a different topic, and that is the electronic medical records. Yeah. In the United States, um, I had two friends recently 
um, who were notified that they had cancer based on going onto their computer and the report was just issued on the computer. I'm now a retired physician and I used to deal with patients with cancer. I am appalled that in our country now, in this country, that's how some people are being notified that they have cancer. And I don't, I, I don't know how to address that. Um, yeah. Well, the, the big data altogether is a major change which will uh, be part now of, uh, there, there is now discussion about uh, re another revision of the Helsinki Declaration with the big data uh, process. Because in a big data, you can't get consent of anyone. I mean, you, you go back to the records of thousands of people you can't get their consent, but on the other hand, the research may be very beneficial for the good of society. So obviously, it has to be done anonymously. But the question is, can you later re-identify the people who are part of your uh, research? And then you know who the person is, you did a research on him, but he doesn't no even, and he didn't consent. So what, what is the room of consent in, in big data uh, situation? That's something that is being now currently discussed in order to revise the whole concept of informed consent. Now, disclosing information that is obtained not by directly uh, treating the patient, but incidentally finding uh, something uh, because you went through records and, and you found some, something like this, that is a, a major problem and some uh, want to distinguish between an information that can be useful and beneficial to the person. So the fact that you incidentally found it is still in his benefit to tell him versus information that he can't do anything about it. Nothing can help. There was once a case that incidentally a, a Huntington gene was found to a person. You can't treat Huntington. Huntington people die with the, in their 30s or 40s. And he's now 20 years of age, he's healthy, he's, uh, he has his whole life in front of him. And incidentally, you found that he is a carrier of Huntington gene. Should you tell him or not? So on the one hand, it really won't, we can't do anything about it. On the other hand, maybe he wants to plan his uh, remaining life. Maybe he doesn't want to have children anymore. Maybe he, he wants to, to travel around the world and have a little fun and before something worse happens. So maybe this information is beneficial in another way, not in a treatment way, but in another way. There are all kinds of such incidental findings. We have now, and I think with this we'll finish, we have now an ongoing case in Israel of a wrong implantation of a fertilized egg. They wrong, uh, by mistake, they took a fertilized egg from a couple and they implanted it in a different, in a different woman, in a different couple. And uh, it, in her eighth month or so, no one knew that this happened, but they discovered a cardiac defect and they did all kinds of uh, treatments and studies to the fetus. And they wanted to understand why is there a heart defect. So part of the investigation is to do a genetic testing to see if it's a syndrome. And incidentally, it turned out that this fetus can't be the child of this couple. So it was clear that by mistake, they implanted a fertilized egg from another couple. Now, should they disclose it at all? What, what good did it make to this couple? What good does it make to the other couple? I mean, it's already there. It's already in the eighth month. The baby will be born. But on the other hand, maybe 
the other couple, the genetic parents, want this baby. So this woman underwent pregnancy and delivery being actually a surrogate, but not wanting to be a surrogate. She wants the child. But maybe the other couple says, we are the genetic parents, give us the child. So are you looking now for the other couple? Who is the other couple? There were 40 options at the, the, the same time were fertilized eggs in the freezer from 40 different couples. So go test 40 people and, and compare them and what will happen. A very complicated situation. So the question of disclosure of incidental findings is very, very tricky. There was another case that a child was tested for a genetic disease, and it turned out that the husband of the mother couldn't be the father, which means that the woman had an affair with another man, and the child was born, and by halachic criteria, the child is a bastard. So if you'll disclose it, this child will never be able to marry by, by Jewish legal uh, criteria. So do you tell it or not? You can marry another mom. <laughs> <laughs> or, or not Israel. We're not married to Israel. I don't know. What, what? Well, then it's interesting. This is, the, this is the state. Like, I mean, Israel is a... I mean, it doesn't have the separation of... Children's... Yeah. America does. Israel's not. Right. No, but, but even in America, by, if this is a Jewish couple, then this child will not be able to marry. It, 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 hello, what? No, all, all over the world, if, if uh, an Orthodox rabbi has to marry them. They can't marry another mamzer? Yes, but go find another mamzer. <laughs> well, that's a different problem. I, I, I think that case is something I'm going to go into. <laughs> I want to thank you so much. The case with the surrogacy, it sounds like the one that Solomon did, but with yep. right, 40, exactly. 40, other, 40, 40 possibilities in the refrigerator. Yeah, but, but the real Solomon case is solvable today by DNA testing. Exactly. But this case is not solvable because where will the child grow is independent on who the mother is. Maybe it's best for him to stay with this uh, child.